Hi, everyone. Welcome to the first uh, keynote session. Uh, we're happy to have uh, Andreas Malm here, who uh, many of you may know, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. Uh, Andreas Malm is a senior lecturer in human ecology at Lund University, as well as a prolific writer and journalist. His research and writings focus on the intersections of capitalism and climate change, as well as the politics of opposing the fossil capitalist system. Among his works are Fossil Capital, The Rise of Steam Power and the Roots of Global Warming, and The Progress of the Storm, Nature and Society in a Warming wor World. Uh, his keynote uh, address is titled, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, Strategies of Escalation in the Struggle Against Climate Catastrophe, which is kind of self-explanatory. Um, it is also the title of an upcoming pamphlet that will be published by Versa. Yeah. Uh, and uh, his keynote will be followed by a short conversation with uh, Joachim Andrian, uh, who uh, is involved in the Action Trainers Collective Climate Justice Program and, and the Gelenda Mobilization, and he is right now also involved in Extinction Rebellion. And uh, after that, uh, we'll turn to the audience for questions as well. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. So what I'm going to say here is based on that little book that Moni mentioned, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, Learning to Fight in a World on Fire. But I, I had to cut out nuances from the argument in the book so it will appear more, even more, like an ultra-leftist deviation and more insane <laughs> than it does in the unabbreviated version, but that is unavoidable. I hope you can bear with me. On the last day of the negotiations, we geared up for our most daring action yet. We had been camping out in a shabby gymnasium in the eastern part of the city for a week. And during those days, we conducted a series of non-violent actions. One day we poured out of subway stations and onto a busy junction in the street and, <clears throat> and blockade, blocked the car traffic with banners calling for emissions to be slashed. The next day, we flooded a thoroughfare with an elaborate street theater, dressed up as trees, flowers, and animals. We lay down on the tarmac, to be run over by a vehicle built of carton and wood to symbolize business as usual. Striding through the flattened crowd, dressed up you and delegates carried signs saying blah 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 and did nothing. And now it was the final day of the negotiations. Hired buses drove all the 500 of us to spots close to the venue. On a signal we marched to the building and tried to prevent the delegates from leaving by locking ourselves to the gates and chains and laying down on the ground, all the while chanting, no more blah 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 action now. No more blah 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 action now. This happened in 1995. The scene was COP1, the very first in the series of UN climate summits in Berlin. And I re recognize at least one comrade in this hall who was there. Tord Bjork is sitting over there. <laughs> the delegates snuck out through a back door. Since then, total annual CO2 emissions in the world have grown by 60%. In the year of that summit, combustion of fossil fuels pumped more than six, six gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere. In 2018, the figure passed 10. In the 25 years after the delegates left, more carbon was released from the underground stocks than in the 75 years before they met. To say that the signals from the climate have fallen on the deaf ears of the ruling classes of this world would be an understatement. If these classes ever had any senses, they have lost them all. They are not perturbed by the smell from the blazing trees. They do not worry at the sight of islands sinking. They do not run from the roar of the approaching hurricanes. Their fingers never need to touch the stalks from withered harvests. Their mouths do not become sticky and dry after a day with nothing to drink. To appeal to their reason and common sense would evidently be most futile. If they possess such fac faculties for engagement with the surrounding reality, the commitment to the endless accumul accumulation of capital trumps them every time. After the past three decades, 
There can be no doubt that the ruling classes are constitutionally incapable of responding to the catastrophe in any other way than by expediting it. Of their own accord, under their inner compulsion, they can do nothing but burn their way to the end. And so we are still here. We erect our camps of sustainable solutions. We march, we block, we stage theaters, we hand over lists of demands to ministers, we chain ourselves, we glue ourselves, we march the next day too. And we are still perfectly, immaculately peaceful. There are more of us now by orders of magnitude, and there is another pitch of desperation in our voices. We talk of extinction and no future, and still business continues very much as usual. At what point do we escalate? When do we conclude that the time has come to also try something more? When do we start physically attacking the things that consume this planet? The only humans and millions of other species can live on and destroy them with our own hands. Is there a good reason we have waited this long? Now some of you might think that I tell this story of COP1 to boast of a long history of climate activism, but I have a sin to confess. For 10 years after it, I was part of the extra parliamentary left in this country, and I held climate and environmental politics in contempt. I consider these issues luxury, hippie, petty bourgeois distractions from the class struggle, irrelevant to the Palestinians and other peoples in the Middle East, beyond the immediate material struggles of the exploited masses of the world. I couldn't have been more wrong, obviously, but unfortunately this is the left's own version of business as usual. Climate and ecology are somehow less central and harder to identify with than working class politics, trade unions, social inequalities, anti-racism, feminism, or whatever else one is committed to and continues to bang on about. Indeed, as Naomi Klein has pointed out, the climate crisis supercharges all of these classical fronts instead, I should say. And as Naomi Klein has pointed out, the climate crisis supercharges all of these classical fronts with existential urgency. Strange as it is, there are parts of the left around the world that still stick to this kind of business as usual and keep climate and ecology a, a footnote at best. They should be happy that they are generally so powerless, otherwise history would judge them harshly. But fortunately, the trend is clear. Left indifference to climate and ecology is rapidly becoming a thing of the past and real solutions to the problems tend to emerge from within our camp. Instead, I tell this story of COP1 as a reminder that the climate movement has been around for a long time. In the global north, it has undergone several cycles of intense activity, each on a larger scale than the former. One rolled through northern Europe between 2006 and 2009, these were the years of the first climate camps in the UK. These were the years of Plain Stupid, of Klimax and Klimata Kohn here in Sweden. The 100,000 people on the streets of Copenhagen during COP15, until then the largest climate demonstration in history. This first cycle ended with the fiasco of COP15 and the economic crisis, but a second set off in 2011 when the US climate movement launched sustained campaigns of civil disobedience focusing on the Keystone XL pipeline. Divestment got underway, blockadia became a buzzword, the Dakota Access Pipeline triggered another high point of mobilization around Standing Rock, and then Donald Trump came to power. During his first week in the White House, he announced that both Keystone and Dakota Access Pipelines would be constructed at maximum speed, and the second cycle came to a dead end. But the crisis itself never relented. There came the extreme summer of last year, and suddenly we had Greta Thunberg, the Fridays for Future, Extinction Rebellion, not hundreds, not thousands, but millions out on the streets, and at least in some countries and regions, a qualitative leap of the movement into something like a mass phenomenon, which had never really happened before. And this ongoing third cycle could well come to an inglorious end like the previous two, perhaps because of an exogenous shock, say a war in the Persian Gulf or a new financial crash, or some missteps, but nothing, I think, indicates peak mobilization just yet. There are potentials for continued growth, simply because the problem in itself will not die away. 
For the first time, the climate movement is now, I think, the single most dynamic social movement in the global north. Known for its youthful, joyful, exuberant, respectful, orderly manifestations. But there is also a darker un undertone to the events, a simmering anger. And it could perhaps be heard most clearly in Greta's already classic how dare you speech to the UN meeting on climate in September, when she excoriated her audience Young people are starting to understand your betrayal, and if you choose to fail us, I say we will never forgive you. Change is coming whether you like it or not. These are some ominous words, and some observers noted a shift in Greta's tone here. A Swedish commentator, Maria G. Franke, writing in Sydsvenskan, warned that if the millions on the streets pleading for their future would be let down once again, quote, a fury such as the world has never before seen will be unleashed. All the three cycles in the 21st century have spun out precisely of the insight that the ruling classes really will not be talked over into action. They are not amenable to persuasion. The louder the sirens wail, the more material they rush to the fire, and so a change of course will have to be forced upon them. So the movement must learn to disrupt business as usual. And to this end, it has developed an impressive repertoire, blockades, occupations, sit-ins, divestment, school strikes, the shutdown of entire city centers, the signal tactic of the climate camp, which I personally have a special fondness for, but which I won't have the time to deal with here. But so far, the movement has stopped short of one mode of action, offensive, or for that matter, defensive physical force. Anything that could be classified as violence has been studiously, scrupulously avoided. And the contrast here couldn't be starker to the wave of social revolt currently sweeping the planet. The Guardian had a special feature on it yesterday, citing one scholar claiming that the levels of popular unrest around the world now approach those of the 1960s, with mass demonstrations and riots that include property destruction and clashes with the police erupting in Hong Kong, Lebanon, France, Ecuador, Haiti, Chile, Iraq, Catalonia, to mention a few places. The climate movement can draw similar crowds, but it would never burn a thing and never throw a stone. It is the distant, well-mannered cousin of social revolt. Indeed, the commitment to absolute nonviolence has stiffened over the cycles, the internalization of the ethos, universal, and the discipline, quite remarkable. I just want to give you one example. In late August 2018, some 700 activists assembled outside a compound of seven great gas cisterns in the Dutch province of Groningen, home to the largest onshore field of fossil gas in Europe. We erected an impromptu camp in front of the compound, blocking transportation in and out. The police lined up on a railway track between the gates and us. A ballast of crushed stones held up the rails. As dusk fell, some 300 locals came marching against Shell and ExxonMobil and ended up in the camp so that the crowd spilled up onto the railway track, at which point the police started raining down their batons and shooting pepper spray, someone fainting and being carried away, others screaming in pain. Not a single stone was picked up and thrown. The supply was abundant. We were standing on top of thousands of stones. We could have pelted the cops, and after such an assault, other types of crowds would have responded in camp. The climate movement would not. And the strictures extend to property destruction. In Groningen, the action consensus every participant had to abide by solemnly pledged that we will not damage machine or infrastructure. Thus far, the movement for averting an uncontrollably spiraling climate catastrophe has not only been civil, it has been gentle and mild in the extreme. There can be no doubt that this posture has served the movement well. It confers upon it a bundle of well-known tactical advantages. If the movement had deployed black block-like tactics from the start, it would never, obviously, have attracted those numbers. The bar for joining a disruption of business as usual is lowered by certificates and promises of peacefulness. Sorry. Our being beaten up on the railway tracks in Groningen earned us the sympathy of the Dutch press. No one could smear us as terrorists or the like. The, the determination of the movement to scale up its challenge to business as usual by means of ever bigger 
bolder mass actions cannot be called into question. This is the main way forward. Let a hundred climate camps bloom and fossil capital might find itself under some real pressure. What can be questioned, however, is something else. Will absolute non-violence be the only way, forever the sole admissible tactic in the struggle to abolish fossil fuels? Or we can formulate this question in a different way. Imagine that the mass mobilizations of this third cycle become impossible to ignore. The ruling classes feel themselves under such heat, perhaps their hearts even melting somewhat at the sight of all these kids with their handwritten signs, that their obduracy wanes. New politicians are voted into office who live up to their election promises. The pressure is kept up from below. Moratoriums on fresh fossil fuel infrastructure are instituted. Germany initiates immediate phase out of coal production. The Netherlands likewise for gas, Norway for oil, the US for all of the above. Legislation and planning are put in place for cutting emissions with at least 10% per year. Renewable energy and public transport are scaled up, plant-based diets promoted, blanket bans on fossil fuels prepared. The movement should be given the chance to see this scenario through. But imagine also that a few years down the road, the kids of the Greta generation and the rest of us wake up one morning and realize that business as usual is still on. Regardless of all the strikes, the science, the pleas, the millions with colorful outfits and banners. This is not beyond the realm of the thinkable. Imagine the greasy and suited wheels roll as fast as ever. What do we do then? Do we then say that we have done what we could, try the means at our disposal and failed? Do we conclude that the only thing left is learning to die? A position already propounded by some, whom I won't have time to deal with here. And do we then just slide down the side of the crater into four, five, eight degrees of warming? Or is there another phase beyond peaceful protest? Meanwhile, in the actually existing capitalist world economy, in parallel to the surging climate movement, money flows to fresh fireplaces. In May, the International Energy Agency released its annual report on investment trends in the world of energy. Capitalists still know what sources to bank on. Two-thirds of capital placed in projects for generating energy in the year 2018 went to oil, gas and coal. That is, to additional facilities for extracting and combusting such fuels on top of all that already spanned the globe as against less than one-third to wind and sun. The share of renewables evinced no growth trend. In fact, global investment here edged downwards by 1%, and that's not a function of falling prices. Investment in coal, on the other hand, turned upwards for the first time since 2012 by 2%. That is, investment in brand new coal supply not only continued, but increased, although not as fast, as in oil and gas. For the third consecutive year, the amount of money streaming into upstream oil and gas, meaning infrastructure for delivering the fuels from under the ground, grew by 6%. Year on year, 6% more capital sunk into fresh drills, wells, rigs. Investment and exploration alone is projected to shoot up by 18% this year. Nowhere on the horizon of ongoing capital accumulation can a transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy be described. Despite the latter source now being consistently cheaper, as noted by billionaire magazine Forbes. The International Energy Agency had the tact enough to notice a growing mismatch. Almost as if apologizing for its report, the agency acknowledged a growing mismatch between current trends and the paths to meeting the goals of maximum 1.5 or 2 degrees global warming. Put differently, the actually existing capitalist world economy not only operates in fundamental disconnect from the sense and science of a planet under fire, not to speak of all aspirations to cool it down, the disconnect is widening. And just the other week, The Guardian published a series of revelations of how much fossil capital prepares to burn, 
The world's 50 largest oil, co oil companies are poised to flood markets with more of the fuel. Most aggressively, Shell and ExxonMobil, which plan for production to increase by 38 and 35% respectively until 2030. These circuits of accumulation are deeply intertwined with financial capital. As The Guardian also revealed, the three largest asset managers in the world, together handling assets worth more than China's entire GDP, continue to pour money into oil, gas and coal at an accelerating rate. Nothing could possibly be more antithetical to the needs of people and planet. How can capitalists go on like this? Current investments, one study observes, can be seen, quote, as an indication that investors do not believe in future climate policy or that they are confident in their own lobbying power. They still feel that they own the world. Fixed capital of this size is normally subject to risks and sensitive to the anticipated policy context. Given the money involved, it would be imprudent to undertake these investments if swings and alterations in the economy threatened premature devaluation, let alone liquidation of the property, but nothing of the kind is in the cards. These capitalists do not see any wrecking balls coming their way. They think they have nothing to fear. How am I doing for time? I'm not really seeing the, the clock over here. You've gone 18 minutes. 18 minutes, okay. Many in the climate movement and most of its intellectuals would shudder at the thought of another stage beyond absolute nonviolence, for a particular doctrine has taken hold of the movement, that of pacifism. It comes in two main forms, moral and strategic pacifism. The moral version is still very present in the movement, but I will bracket it here and instead concentrate on its strategic twin. It says that violence committed by social movements always takes them further from their goal. Turning to violent methods is not so much wrong as ineffective, counterproductive, poor strategy in short. Although derived from and accented by the moral source, it is this strategic doctrine that has gripped the imagination of the movement, and it is Extinction Rebellion, or XR, that has codified it most stringently. In its own origin story, the rebellion began with a small group of people in the UK going to the library. Freaked out about unmitigated breakdown, they wanted to find a workable strategy for changing the behavior of the powers that be, and what they found was something they called the civil resistance model. And in the official handbook of the rebellion, Roger Hallam, co-founder and ideologist, spells out the creed, I quote. There are two types of disruption, violent and non-violent. Violence is a traditional method. It is brilliant at getting attention and creating chaos and disruption, but it is often disastrous when it comes to creating progressive change. Violence destroys democracy and the relationships with opponents which are vital to creating peaceful outcomes to social conflict. The social science is totally clear on this. Violence does not optimize the chance of successful progressive outcomes. In fact, it almost always leads to fascism and authoritarianism. The alternative then is non-violence. So much as there is scientific consensus that global heating is the outcome of human deeds, so the sum total of social science and history supply an unambiguous lesson. I quote again, if you practice nonviolence, you are more likely to succeed. End quote. It follows that popular mobilization against impending extinction, quote, has to stay nonviolent. As soon as you allow violence into the mix, you destroy the diversity and community basis upon which all successful mass mobilizations are based. Full compliance with this command is, quote, rule number one for all participants, end quote. So rebels are instructed to offer flowers to the police. Such strategic pacifism is deduced from a particular reading of history. It has set the climate movement in the global north bubbling and fizzing with references to struggles past. If they could prevail, the reasoning goes, so can we. If they change the world by all means but violence once, so we shall save it. And the argument is not that violence would be bad at this particular moment, say because the level of class struggle is so low in the global north that adventurist actions would only rebound and suppress it further, words that would never pass XR lips. 
nor that it might be expedient only under conditions of severe repression. Instead, strategic pacifism holds that violence is bad in all settings, because this is what history shows. Success belongs to the peaceful. The roster of analogies begins with slavery. If the abolitionists could turn the tables on that nefarious institution, so long taken for granted as a natural part of modern economies, through boycotts, mass meetings, and thundering denunciations of inequity, then we will do the same. And we got an excellent example of this way of reasoning in Dagens Nyheter the other day in a full-page essay by Björn Olenia. Abolition is here conceived as a reprogramming of ethical codes. Slavery went from foundation or abomination and fossil fuels would go the same way, and the abolitionists as armed with moral force. Or as one Oxford professor much taken by XR and Greta recently wrote by way of analogy, the anti-slavery movement only took off the anti-slavery movement only took off once white people in Europe and America began to see people of African descent not as property, but as people. And then there were the suffragettes, much invoked by XR, and of course Gandhi, and the civil rights movement, and the victory over apartheid, and the fall of Hosni Mubarak on Tahrir Square, and other episodes that all be key the moral of strict nonviolence as the royal road to climate stabilization. Based on this kind of analogies, strategic, strategic pacifism, pacifism is now utterly hegemonic in the movement. How should its narrative be assessed? <coughs> now, I, I obviously don't have the time to go into the historical details here. I would love to tear apart the myth of Gandhi and delve into Mkonto Vesizwe and consider what actually happened around Tahrir Square, but I will instead have to give short shrift to the case of slavery and say only a few words on the suffrage. Slavery was not abolished by conscientious white people gently disassembling the institution. The impulse to subvert it sprang, of course, from the enslaved Africans themselves. And they very rarely possessed the option of non-violent civil disobedience. Staging a sit-in on the field or boycotting the food offered by the master could only hasten their death. From Nanny of the Maroons to Nat Turner, collective action against slavery per force took on the character of violent resistance. The first sweeping emancipation of slaves occurred in the Haitian Revolution, hardly a bloodless affair. And as some recall, slavery in the US was terminated by a civil war whose death toll still remains close to the aggregate from all other military conflicts that country has been embroiled in. If there was one white abolitionist who helped precipitate that showdown, it was John Brown with his armed raids on the planters and armories. Talk, 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 he exclaimed after yet another convention of a pacifist abolitionist society. That will never free the slaves. What is needed is action action. Would slavery have ended without the slaves and their allies fighting back? The scholar who has most ambitiously sought to downplay the causal impact of slave revolts, Portuguese historian João Pedro Marques, has met with a barrage of criticisms from other specialists in the field. One of the most prominent, Robin Blackburn, has retorted that the very notion of slavery as unethical, harmful to the slaves, whom the masters wish to portray as happy and docile, originated in the acts of explosive refusal. Even the most pacifist Quakers pointed to the revolts on the plantations as proof of the horrors of the peculiar institution. Blackburn writes, there was a cumulative character to anti-slavery in the age of abolition. There was a steadily rising tide of discontent and discomfort sent off by the Quakes on the plantations. And granted, among a host of other factors, the efforts of white petitioners, demonstrators, legislators, and medallion sellers partook of the ending of slavery, but to reduce the process to their efforts, or even to make them the gist of the story, is about as accurate as the belief that yoga is the sole path to human happiness. And the belief that slavery was abolished because white people understood what is good and right, with no room for black agency in the story, is something that approaches historiographical racism. And now the suffragettes. The suffragettes. Their tactical choice was property destruction. 
Decades of patient pressure on parliaments to give women the vote had yielded nothing. And so in 1903, under the slogan, Deeds Not Words, the Women's Social and Political Union was founded. Five years later, two WSPU members undertook the first militant action, breaking window panes in the Prime Minister's residence. One of them told the police she would bring a bomb the next time. Fed up with their own fruitless deputations to Parliament, the suffragettes soon specialised in the argument of the broken pane, sending hundreds of well-dressed women down streets to smash every window they passed. Not quite the civil resistance model. Militancy was at the core of suffragette identity. To be militant in some form or other is a moral obligation, Emmeline Pankhurst lectured. It is a duty which every woman will, who will owe her own conscience and self-respect to women who are less fortunate than she is herself and to all who are to come after her. The latest full-body por portrait of the movement, Diane Atkinson's Rise Up Women, the remarkable rise of the suffragette, lives of the suffragettes, evolves into an encyclopedic listing of militant actions. Activists forcing the Prime Minister out of his car and dousing him with pepper, hurling a stone at the fanlight above Winston Churchill's door, setting upon statues and paintings with hammers and axes, planting bombs on sites selected for royal visits, fighting policemen with staves, charging against hostile politicians with dog whips, breaking the windows in prison cells, and so on and so forth. Such deeds did not exclude, but went hand in hand with mass mobilization. The suffragettes put up mammoth rally, rallies, ran their own presses, went on hunger strikes, deployed the gamut of nonviolent and militant action. After the hope of attaining the vote by constitutional means was dashed once more in early 1913, the movement switched gears again. In a systematic campaign of arson, the suffragettes set fire to or blew up villas, tea pavilions, boathouses, hotels, haystacks, churches, post offices, aqueducts, theatres, and a very liberal range of other targets around the country. In one and a half year, the WSPU claimed responsibility for 337 such attacks. Not a single life was lost. Buildings were set ablaze when empty. The suffragettes took great pains to avoid injuring people, but they considered the situation urgent enough to justify incendiarism. Votes for women, Pankhurst explained, were of such pressing importance that, quote, we had to discredit the government and parliament in the eyes of the world. We had to spoil English sports, hurt businesses, destroy valuable property, demoralize the world of society, shame the churches, upset the whole orderly conduct of life, end quote. This from a person who you can find with, with statues, revered, quite revered in the UK. Some attacks probably went unclaimed. One historian suspects that the suffragettes were probably behind one of the most spectacular blazes of the period, a fire in a tiny side coal wharf in which the facilities for loading coal were completely gutted. They did, however, claim responsibility for the burning of motor cars and a steam yacht. It's fairly easy to puncture all the remaining analogies peddled by strategic pacifists in the liberation from British colonial occupation, in the struggle against Jim Crow, in the victory over apartheid, and the toppling of Hosni Mubarak, violence in different forms was very present indeed. This is entirely well known. Strategic pacifism, I think, must be seen as an exercise in repression. It is a mixture of forgery and cant. And the same goes for the book that XR built itself on, the one study its founders poured over in the library, Why Civil Resistance Works, The Strategic Logic of Nonviolent Conflict by Erika Chenoweth and Maria J. Stephen, a catechism of strategic pacifism that I personally consider to be a model for how to most systematically distort the historical record. But again, I'll, I'll skip this here. Instead, I will jump to the conclusion that the logic of the comparisons would have to be inverted. It would need to say, admittedly, Violence occurred in the struggle against slavery, against male monopoly on the vote, against all these other systems of oppression. But the struggle against fossil fuels is of a wholly different character and will succeed only on condition of utter peacefulness. But would there be convincing reasons for such a position? Is the root system of fossil fuels within the prevailing order so shallow that they can be extracted with smaller effort than any of those other ills? 
Are they not entwined with overbearing power and fabulous profit? Should we expect there to be less friction, less conflict in this transition from ballooning to zero emissions? Do our experiences so far tell us that we can swim through this transition without have ever having to contemplate other methods? Or what exactly is the property of the climate that sets it apart from these other crises? If the analogies are taken seriously, this emergency indeed has the rank of something like slavery or political discrimination of women, the conclusion would seem to tend towards the opposite. And then there is the whole dimension of time. Around COP1, few would have thought that two or three decades down the line, the economies of the world would discharge nearly one gigaton of carbon per month. The corporations busily plan for augmented capacity to combust fossil fuels, and the governments preside over it all, proudly or passively. Officially, responsiveness to the crisis has exceeded all expectations. So has, no less faithfully, the response of the climate system. At the, top of COP1, at the time of COP1, few scientists foresaw that the land and the ocean so soon would fail to soak up the gases emitted, become overfilled and disturbed, and start leaking and puffing carbon dioxide and methane at the rate now reached. So we find ourselves between two blades of a scissor. On the one hand, unbending business as usual, taking emissions ever higher and confounding hopes for mitigation. On the other, delicate ecosystems crashing down, the extraordinary inertia of the capitalist mode of production meeting the reactivity of the earth. This is the temporal predicament in which the climate movement has to devise meaningful strategies. Even under optimistic assumptions, the pathways to a tolerable future are rapidly narrowing, in the words of the umpteenth scientific supplication for immediate global action. Some months back, a team of scientists published an overview of the global investment landscape in nature and concluding that limiting warming to one and a half degree still remains technically possible on two conditions. First, to have a reasonable chance of respecting that limit, human societies would have to institute, quote, a global prohibition of all new CO2 emitting devices, end quote. Now, the likelihood of the ruling classes implementing a global prohibition of all new CO2 emitting devices, because scientists tell them to, or because billions of people would otherwise suffer grievous harm, or because the planet could spill into a hothouse, is about the same as them lining up at the foot of the steepest mountain and meekly proceeding to throw themselves off the summit. So here is what a climate movement of millions, many millions, could do for a start. Whether it will do it is another matter, but here is what it could and perhaps also should do. Announce and enforce the prohibition. Damage and destroy new CO2 emitting devices. Put them out of commission, pick them apart, demolish them, burn them. Let the capitalists who keep on investing in the fire know that their properties will be trashed. The immediate purpose of such a campaign against CO2 emitting property would be to establish a disincentive to invest in more of it. It will not require that all new devices be disabled or dismantled, only sufficiently many to credibly communicate the risk. Strict selectivity would need to be observed. There was a randomness to the property destruction undertaken by the suffragettes, which perhaps served the purpose at that time, but wouldn't do so now, if activists from the climate movement were to attack post offices and tea pavilions and theatres, investors would not be dissuaded from anything in particular. It would have to be cold wharfs and steam yachts only this time. But just like the suffragettes sought to twist the arm of the state on their own, they could obviously legislate no voting rights, the aim would be to force states to proclaim the prohibition and then, of course, begin retiring the existing stock of devices. In the words of another study, the current global energy system is the largest network of infrastructure ever built, reflecting tens of trillions of dollars of assets and two centuries of technological evolution, more than 80% of which energy still comes from fossil fuels. No one in his or her right mind would think that bands of activists could burn very much of that to the ground, or indeed that such a fire would be unequivocally desirable. 
At the end of the day, it would be states who ran through the transition or no one will. But the states have fully proven that they will not be the prime movers. The question is not if sabotage from a militant wing of the climate movement will solve the crisis on its own, clearly a pipe dream. But if the disruptive commotion necessary for shaking business as usual out of the rocks can come about without it, it would, I think, seem foolhardy to trust in its absence and stick to tactics for normal times. Recognizing the dynamics of the situation, it is time for the movement to more decisively shift from protest to resistance. Protest is when I say I don't like this. Resistance is when I put an end to what I don't like. Protest is when I say I refuse to go along with this anymore. Resistance is when I make sure everybody else stops going along too. As one West German colonist wrote in 1968. Small steps in this direction have already been taken. On the night when Donald Trump got elected president, two Catholic workers, Jessica Resnicek and Ruby Montoya, trespassed onto a site for construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline. They brought coffee canisters filled with rags and motor oil, placed them on the seats of six pieces of heavy machinery and lit matches. Five of the six were burned out. Autodidacts in the field, the rest in Czech and Montoya then learned to use welding torches with oxygen and acetylene to burn through the steel in the pipes. Protective gear on, they raided the pipeline up and down the state in the spring of 2017 and pierced holes in it, compressing the action into seven minutes of hit and run. Then they returned to arson. Equipment at multiple sites were set on fire with parcels soaked in gasoline. The attacked property belonged to Energy Transfer, a conglomerate of pipeline companies on whose boards one could find Rick Perry, Secretary of Energy under Donald Trump. Resnicek and Montoya had immersed themselves in the movement against the Dakota Access Pipeline, and they reacted to defeat not by capitulating, but by moving on to the next phase. I quote, after exploring and exhausting all avenues of protest, including attending public commentary hearings, gathering signatures for valid requests for environmental impact statements, participating in civil disobedience, hunger strikes, marches and rallies, boycotts and encampments, we saw the clear deficiencies of our government to hear the people's demands, the two Catholic workers explained in their community. Eventually, they resolved to come out and confess responsibility for what they had done. We are speaking publicly to empower power others to act boldly, with purity of heart, to dismantle the infrastructure which deny us rights to water, land and liberty, Resnicek and Montoya told a press conference. Their sabotage delayed construction of the pipeline for an uncertain number of months, but no matter how frequently they perforated it, two individuals could not on their own obviously bring down the juggernaut. That would have required organized upscaling. Another few cases notwithstanding, the movement has by and large left property destruction an untried tactic. What if it became more than a one-off occurrence? What if hundreds or thousands followed in the footsteps of Resnicek and Montoya? On what grounds could that be cause for regret and condemnation? Well, I don't think there would be a shortage of objections to it. Bill McKibben is a moral and a strategic pacifist and the greatest leader of the climate movement before Greta came along. I once asked him after an energizing speech to a capacity crowd when, given that the situation is as urgent as he portrayed it and as we all know it is, we escalate. He was visibly ill at ease. The first part of his response presented what we might call the objection from asymmetry. As soon as a social movement engages in violent acts, it moves onto the terrain favored by the enemy who is overwhelmingly superior in military <coughs> capabilities. The state loves a fight of arms, it knows that we win. Our strength is in numbers. This is a pet argument for strategic pacifists, but it is disingenuous. Violence is not the sole field where asymmetry prevails. The enemy has overwhelmingly superior capabilities in virtually all fields, including media propaganda, institutional coordination, logistical resources, political legitimacy, and above all, money. If the movement should shun uphill battles, a divestment campaign seems like the worst possible choice, trying to sap fossil capital by means of capital. There is a centuries or even millennia long history of slingshots down in Goliaths and other tactics ingenuous enough to find cracks in the armor. To take but one recent case, 
As part of the mass resistance in the besieged Gaza Strip in the spring of 2018, Palestinians invented techniques for flying kites and inflated condoms with incendiary materials across the wall to burn Israeli property. The most powerful state in the Middle East, armed to the teeth with atomic bombs and the most sophisticated systems for intercepting rockets, stood helpless before these lumpen missiles from the most thoroughly deprived fragment of people. No law says that asymmetry in this particular field can ever be overturned from below, nor that violence must conflict with the strength of numbers. Rather, unarmed collective violence of the kind we're seeing on a daily basis right now, from Santiago to Nasiriya, is one expression of that strength, one way of bringing down the seemingly invincible. Property destruction has always been essential to it. Can it ever acquire mass proportions in the climate struggle? Well, I think only if the movement first overcomes the taboo against it. But not everyone can mix a Molotov cocktail or cook a coffee canister with motor oil. <laughs> this is the objection from demography, averring that non-violence is inherently attractive to the masses and violence exclusionary. And sure, there's truth in this. The festive atmosphere in a square taken over by protesters has more to speak for it and less to scare people away than a mayhem of stone throwing. This is one reason why, one, non-violent mass mobilization should, where possible, be the first resort, militant action only the last. And two, no movement should ever voluntarily suspend the former, only consider giving it appendages. That said, the mass appeal of the civil disobedience etiquette can be overblown. XR has gone out of its way to shower the police in love. In the handbook, we learn that rebels should seek to, quote, actively try to get arrested, end quote. And that this desire is, quote, at the heart of the Extinction Rebellion. End quote. Well, this appears to some people. As pointed out in an open letter to XR after the London Spring Uprising earlier this year, written by Wretched of the Earth, a network of climate activists of color and uh, other allies in the movement, throwing oneself into the arms of the police is a sign of privilege. People from racialized communities might hesitate to do so. Middle class whites can count on the good manners of the cops, not so working class Muslims or blacks or migrants without papers. This might be one reason why XR in its first year of existence has been plagued by a whiteness out of all proportion to the demography in the cities where it has acted. Others would feel summoned by a more confrontational or evasive approach to the repressive state apparatus. At the end of the day, as the wretched of the earth asserted, we are too many and too manifold to fit into one boat, the only vessel that can make room for the level of participation required to win this fight of our lives is a diversity and plurality of tactics. Yes, such diversity and plurality would open for internal tensions, which no movement that has altered the course of history has done without. There is something suspicious about total tactical conformity. The second part of McKibben's response advanced the objection from popular support. As soon as violence is thrown into the mix, it evaporates. The movement can win sympathy by clasping hands around the White House, or blocking a gas terminal with a fleet of canoes, or staging a die-in a natural history museum, but it can only repel the public by burning things or clashing with cops. Again, there is clearly a grain of truth in this, particularly in the US, McKibben's home country. France is different. A French social movement does not automatically become pariah if it spices up mass mobilization with some property destruction and rioting. <laughs> there is no biological law of repellence, even in the global north. Rather, we face an ostensible paradox here in that the US is a vastly more violent society as measured by the diffusion of guns, the incidence of mass shootings, the veneration of armed heroes in popular <coughs> culture, the belligerence of the state, and any other yardstick than France, and yet the intolerance for violence committed by social movements is at its highest in the former. But the paradox dissolves when we consider that the US swept the slate clean for unrestrained capitalism by means of genocidal violence. France, on the other hand, still has a perennially renewed legacy of popular upheaval and a comparatively, comparatively combative working class. The tolerance for subaltern violence stands in inverse relation to the absoluteness of capitalist domination and the consequent suffusion of violence in a social formation. American allergy, in other words, is a pathology. 
More than Americans, however, live in six societies, and activists obviously have to learn how to behave inside them without instantly alienating their intended audiences. But neither should they take public aversion to even the softest sabotage as a natural fact. Levels of receptivity are contingent on time, and this must hold in particular for the climate struggle. At six degrees of heating, the itch to blow up pipelines might be well nigh universal among whatever humanity remains. We should posit a law of a tendency of the receptivity to rise in a rapidly warming world. Anything else would be to presume a species-wide death wish. If fossil fuels continue to be combusted and temperatures to climb, physical attacks on the sources of the more and more dreadful, less and less deniable calamities should resonate with broader and broader layers. The only interference with this tendency would be an actual annulment of business as usual, a Green New Deal, or some similar policy package breaking the curve and moving towards zero, then property destruction would appear superfluous to many. This would of course be the best case scenario to which all efforts should contribute. In its absence, receptivity must go up from however low levels because climate breakdown does not smolder. It has no stasis. It will be exacerbated by biogeochemical and physical processes that cannot be negotiated. And in the light of this temporality, Typical prognosis of popular support for violence would need to be revised. Do I have another few minutes? Yes. Yes, I'm soon. The problem, of course, is that blowing up a pipeline in a six degrees world would be to act a little late in the day. Should we wait for approval from a near consensus, a majority, a big minority? The task of climate activists cannot be to take an existing level of consciousness as a given, but rather to stretch it. Climate activists should walk ahead, not too far from the masses, which would lead to isolation, nor in the median or in the rear, which would obviate their mission. They must prepare to be calumniated by some, anything else would be prove, proof of inefficacy, while steering clear of tactics that would put off too many. This is the tightrope walked by any working vanguard. Actions should be undertaken if plan, goal and execution can be explained, and garner support in an intimate relation to the existing consciousness to be pushed up a notch. And this is one of many reasons why it would obviously be a very bad idea to assassinate the coal executive or fly an airplane into an Exxon mobile skyscraper. Intelligent sabotage is something else. It should be explainable and acceptable to enough numbers in some places, and if not today, then surely after a little more of this breakdown. Time and timing are of the essence here. Every extreme weather event now blows with the force of accumulated emissions and gives a foretaste of misery to come. That should be the moment to strike and stretch. Next time the wildfires burn through the forests of Europe, take out a pipeline. Next time a Caribbean island is battered beyond recognition, burst in upon a shell headquarter. The weather is already political, but it is political from one side only, blowing off the steam built up by the enemy who is never made to feel the heat or take the blame. And then there is the inevitable objection from repression. Why provoke the state to rain down its harshest measures on the movement? Just the other week, Jessica Resnicek and Ruby Montoya were indicted on charges that carried 110 years in prison. The previous year, a panel at a conference for oil and gas corporations in Houston, Texas, discussed the looming danger of sabotage, which they apparently fear, and the need for the state to throttle it. Kelsey Warren, CEO of Energy Transfer, fossil fuel billionaire and supporter of Perry and Trump, took direct aim at the two obnoxious women. Quote, I think you're talking about somebody who needs to be removed from the gene pool. Resnicek and Montoya risked the most draconian punishment in the act of resistance and were ready to pay the price. Should they be upbraided for the choice? Well, strategic pacifism holds it against violent resistance that it mandates high levels of both commitment and risk tolerance, in the words of Chenoweth and Stephen, and such levels are not for everyone. But seen from another angle, the consequent sacrifice is a signal to others that this is worth fighting for even spending the rest of one's life in jail for. And the climate crisis could do with some more acts of that caliber. So far, few have been prepared to risk more than a couple of nights under arrest. 
Compared to what struggling people in history have gone through, the comfort levels of climate activism in the global north must be deemed high, which does not quite bespeak the significance of the problem. Now, before I end, I must comment on the action that has drawn a lot of, content, uh, lot of attention in, in recent weeks and perhaps become the most controversial thing ever done by the climate movement in the global north, and you probably know what I'm thinking of. When tens of thousands of activists are engaged in law-breaking, some errors are to be expected. During its two weeks long autumn uprising, XR had approximately 30,000 people out on the streets of London to create maximum annoyance and disturbance, and perhaps a, la a lapse was unavoidable. But its target and manner of execution were not. In the morning rush hours of 17th of October, a group of XR activists entered the London Underground and Light, tra uh, light Rail System to stop the traffic. Two of them brought a ladder into the Canning Town tube station in the eastern part of the city, placed it against the train, climbed on top of the roof, and unfolded a banner reading, business as usual equals death. Commuters on the platform were first baffled and then furious. They appeared to have belonged to the city's largely non-white working class. On the many films circulating afterwards, one voice can be heard shouting, I need to get to work, I have to feed my kids. The crowd surged towards the train, screaming for the men to calm down. One commuter, incidentally a black man, in blue jeans and a plain beanie, tried to climb onto the roof, at which point one of the activists, incidentally a white man, in a suit and a tie, aimed a hard kick at his head. White man on top, kicking black man below, then being dragged down onto the platform and set apart. Causing an uproar in the city, the incident marked a disgraceful end to the autumn uprising. But what constituted this as the stupidest action ever undertaken by the climate movement in the global north was the response by XR London, hub of the global rebellion. It had the opportunity to wash its hands of the men in the tube, but instead the official statement exonerated the kick against the head as an act of self-defense. Excuse the activists by appealing to their high characters, quote, they were a grandfather, an ex-Buddhist teacher, a vicar, and a former GP, among others, end quote, and defended the action as planned, quote, within Extinction Rebellion's principles and values centered around non-violence and compassion. One of the co-founders went on BBC to bless the action as peaceful and non-violent. Others in XR London, a majority, according to one poll, veh vehemently opposed it. But given the amount of self-policing and internalization of tactical principles the movement has proved itself capable of, one has to ask how this slipped through. Three factors are immediately apparent. First, and uh, yeah, this, 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 uh, a full elaboration of this argument will require more time. But first, the strategy of XR has been to wreak generalized, but mind you, non-violent havoc on the urban fabric in the belief that this will force politicians to respond adequately to the crisis. This is how change happens, Roger Hallam and the other ideologists have taught. The fossil economy is here understood as something similar to a dictatorship. And that's a category mistake that licenses the targeting of pretty much anything for disruption. Hence the fantastic fallacy of stopping an underground train. As anyone with rudimentary knowledge of the climate problem will know, and as commuters at Canning Town shouted out, public transport is part of the solution. That climate activists could get it into their heads to obstruct it, beggars belief. Second, XR has remained persistently aloof from factors of class and race, because it has been solidly based in white middling strata with no other standpoint than their own. I hope you don't think uh, I'm too nasty to this kind of strata, which I guess I belong to myself when I say this, but the rhetoric and aesthetics of XR drip of a kind of piety and smugness those strata are uniquely prone to. Or, as one Guardian columnist dryly asked, quote, why do so many XR occupations look like an audience in search of a national theater? And why would an XR campaigner think it persuasive to tweet, we are engineers, we are lawyers, we are doctors, we are everyone. <laughs> Unlike certain other branches of the movement, anti-capitalism and class antagonism are absent from the XR discourse. But look at it 
which way you will, from the angle of investment, production, or consumption. It is the rich that drive this breakdown. And a climate movement that does not want to eat the rich with all the hunger of those who struggle to put food on the table will never hit home. A climate movement without social anger will not acquire the striking capacity. It should have no difficulties developing the point. Not only do the rich make our lives miserable, they are working to end lives of multitudes, but this seems unlikely to happen within the frames of an organization like XR. Instead, a safely hegemonic doctrine of pacifism would ensure that the climate movement remains at best that distant cousin of social revolt in the 2020s. The exigent strategic task is to wed the two. Third, the violence that XR eventually engaged in, engaged in did not target police or private property, but a black man on the way to his job. And this cannot really be seen as accidental. Nor do we have reason to doubt that if an XR activist had kicked a cop in the head, the repudiation would have been unequivocal. Pacifism has perhaps never existed as a real thing. What exists is the ability or not to distinguish between forms of violence. The, pe the peculiarity of pacifism is that it imbues its adherence with a self-righteousness born out of the fetishization of one, sometimes, quite often, useful type of tactic. But if the temptation to fetishize one kind of tactic should be resisted, this applies, of course, to property destruction and other forms of violence, too. The tactic with the greatest potentials for this movement might be something completely different. It might be the climate camp, or it might be something else. General strikes by industrial workers for a Green New Deal would be nice, for instance. My central claim is that we need to have a more open discussion about tactics for the climate movement in the years ahead. I hope you don't think I'm too crazy in saying this, but perhaps I am. Andreas, uh, let us proceed to the interrogative phase of this uh, talk. And uh, with us here we have uh, Joachim Andrian, who is uh, involved in the Action Trainers Collective Climate Justice Program and, uh, and the Gelander Mobilizations, and is also involved in Extinction Rebellion. So, so is it on? Yeah. <coughs> so, um, thanks for the bravery of you of uh, inviting XR activists to uh, question me after, after this. I think um, this decision. <laughs> okay, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so I, I want to talk about strategy and I want to talk about tactics. And uh, we can't do that with, with, without looking at what, what do we have now. And uh, there are many things I would like, like to talk about uh, about XR in, uh, in, a long, in a longer session. But I will uh, uh, now start with the most relevant parts. XR is the, uh, is the biggest disruptive movement that we have right now. And, uh, and despite the idiots in our movement, despite the tactical misjudgment, despite the historical mi mis misreading, we are uh, the most dis disruptive movement that, uh, ex uh, that exists in the, in the climate or eco eco ecological movements right now. Uh, and the recent growth in the movement has been has happened not despite but because of its uh, its uh, non-violence and uh, and it, it's very important to not throw out the baby with a baby with a bath, bath water here because I've uh, I've been involved in many trainings and I've seen all the, over the over the past years the movement growing from it I'm now talking about Sweden growing from dozens to thousands of people ready to uh, ready to block infrastructure ready to shame themselves ready to engage in all sorts of disruptive activities and now we're not talking about law lawyers, now we're talking about librarians, truck drivers, caretakers. Um, and I've seen this happen. And uh, we, we've seen the increase, increased disruption, we've seen the uh, fault of the seagulls hap uh, happening in the, in the non-violence uh, movement in Sweden uh, that uh, eventually ended, uh, ended the um, expansion of the, uh, of the Gothenburg coal mine. We've seen unprecedented organizational strength uh, in the north, um, and uh, 
and right now it's very popular to to, uh, to bash XR, and all groups want to uh, want to put their own strategies uh, into XR or say that XR should should do this instead, or XR is uh, is worthless for, for for these reasons. But at the same time, we need to ask why hasn't that uh, those tactics works work yet, and why did XR happen? So I want, want to talk to talk about them a, a little bit in relation to each other as, as you have uh, as you have started with. Um, so first of all, um, how if, if we engage uh, if uh, if the movement would engage in, in these uh, militant actions, uh, if we if we enforce uh, what did you say enforce a pro pro prohibition on all new uh, infrastructure? How would that lead to power? How would that lead to uh, to shifting uh, to shifting the, the ways governments act, to, shi to, to building possibilities for a, for a stronger movement, to transitioning our societies, um, and all that stuff? How? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so f first of all, I, I just. I just have to give you right in everything you say about XR. So, like I said, uh, to to shrink my book, which isn't that long, in fact, but anyway, to uh, to, to the size of a, a presentation like this, I had to take away a lot of nuances. So, I have a lot of praise for XR in the book, and I mean, I mean, XR is not only the largest disruptive branch of the climate movement, but it has undergone an absolutely phenomenal explosive exponential growth in a year and you can only feel humble when you look at what what, what those people have achieved you don't need to praise it i guess no no yeah, 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 but i wanted to have that for the record because i just sound like one of the one more of those ultra left leftist x art basher and maybe i am but i'm i hope i'm a little bit more new uh, now one argument i also make in the book and that this connects to your second question is that i don't really I don't really know if I want XRs to behave differently. I think they're doing their job pretty well. I also think Bill McKibben is doing his job pretty well. But uh, one, one uh, current in social movement theory and research that I've drawn <coughs> um, when, I, when I think about this is the radical flank effect theory. Closer to the mic. Yeah, the, the theory of the radical flank. And to, to, make, to make things very... Uh, short and simple here. So this is based on the study of the civil rights movement in, uh, in the United States. And in the 1950s and early 60s, this, the civil rights movement led by Martin Luther King and his circle appeared very radical, not to say extremist, because it incited people to break laws and go to jail. Uh, it didn't really come very far until the turning point in Birmingham in 1963, when the first urban riot erupted. And Martin Luther King ended up in jail, and he wrote his famous uh, letter from Birmingham jail, where he said openly to the white state that unless you listen to us now and give us what we demand, this is what you'll get. Blood will flow. And there is an abundance of historical research that has demonstrated that it was exactly this line of argument that made the Kennedy administration then followed by the Lyndon administration, concede to the main demands of the civil rights movement. There was a radical flank on the side of the civil rights movement, embodied by urban rioting, but politically organized by Malcolm X and subsequent, subsequently the Black Power Movement, Black, Power, uh, Plank, the Black Panther Party. And these groups scared the shit out of the white regime. And all of a sudden, the former radical flank, named the civil rights movement, appeared to be a moderate flank. So the benchmark for radicalization moved very quickly. And at that point in historical time, the main concessions in the form of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the other legislations that ensured the, the, some of the fundamental human rights of black people, we know all their problems, but anyway, happened precisely when there emerged a radical flank. Does the climate movement have a radical flank? Well, right now it looks like XR is the radical flank. So the analogy we hear would be that we are somewhere before the Birmingham riot. We're in the late 1950s or early 1960s when people 
who incite to civil disobedience, non-violence, law-breaking, appear to be radical. But those groups, history tells us, and you, 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 see, you, can, you can use the radical fact theory to, to explain the whole development of the labor movement in Europe. We wouldn't, as you know, we would never have had a, a people's home, a welfare state, and with all of it, without the threat of a radical flank to the left and to the east of the mainstream labor movement. This is how social reforms are won, with the threats of revolutionary uh, advances or even some extent of chaos. So far, I don't think that the, the climate movement has had a radical flank. You know, Greta is often compared to Rosa Parks, which I think is quite adequate. You know, there are all these analogies floating around. You have to see the, <laughs> the very uh, considerable concrete differences in all these cases. But yes, there is some similarity between how Greta, as a, as a lone individual, kicked off an entire movement just as Rosa Parks did. But I don't see the climate movement having a Stoker Carmichael or an Angela Davis or someone like that. And I think before it has persons like that, leaders, groups like that, there will be something lacking. And I, so, <clears throat> I would never say that, that, that acts of sabotage as such will somehow catapult the climate movement into state power. Obviously not. But if, if you look at processes where social movements have enforced changes, uh, in, in, in societies reasonably similar to our own over the past century, let's say, you see very, very rare cases where major changes have been made without threats of militant violence. Yeah, so um, as you say, we haven't, we haven't seen this yet. So I've, I've been... Uh, I've been looking at the cases we have uh, we have seen yet, and uh, um, maybe this is a bad comparison. But uh, if you look at the, the biggest uh, the biggest militant group fighting uh, fighting fossil fuel uh, infrastructure in the history yet, we see we find the Niger Delta Avengers in 2016. Uh, they destroyed a lot of oil infrastructure in the Niger Delta, um, and they weren't. Uh, uh, as I know, they didn't care about climate change at all. They were fighting neocolonization um, and, and the results of the uh, of the oil um, of the oil oil, oil drilling, drilling in the Niger Delta. Um, and one of the things one of the things they um, uh, they accomplished w was destroying the state budget uh, and uh, and. Um, just that destruction that comes from uh, from the state budget and and uh, what what you are uh, what you want to happen is the is, is for the state to uh, invest in uh, invest in that transition. At the same time, we're seeing as as how the um, fossil fuel uh, uh, fossil fuel industry is wor working right now is finding new ways to get states to bear their costs maybe in australia we see the we see the biggest example of that where they uh, where they have basically gotten um, gotten the state to bear the bear the cost of the adani coal mine which uh, in case of a bankruptcy which they aim on will happen because um, yeah and um, yeah so i'm still not convinced how, how this uh, how this build, builds power and how, how this nos, does not uh, just um, turn the, turn a group of, of militants into uh, into a into a group of uh, uh, of hated terrorists and at the same time we uh, to do the co a comparison to, to exorgan um, and in in lack of um, Marxist groups or anti-capitalist groups with, with popular support, they have developed it, uh, this uh, this concept of the of the citizens assembly, and uh, and the citizens assembly uh, is, is one of the main uh, demands of XR were uh, were uh, uh, a group of group of citizens, not the usual politi politician, but uh, uh, but a group of randomly se selected people that uh, represent the populations should get together and find out find out the best best solution. And this is this is based on um, how, how this 
previous citizen assemblies that, that have solved the questions in, in, in the past. And this is, of course, controversial, but, and uh, we don't know that it will work. But it is one thing that we, uh, that we see, um, that we see uh, some kind of support for that builds much easier than, uh, uh, than any Marxist or, or anti-capitalist groups have, uh, have done yet. So, again, how? Technical point, Andreas. Keep it short, and then we'll transition over to questions from the audience. Well, on the matter of popular support from Marxism, I just have to mention that the UK is currently led by a group of comrades with, who are openly affiliated to Marxism. And I guess they're still at least the second largest party in the country, Labour. So, so it would be impossible to, to find support for for class-based policies, even in a country such as the UK. I think it's, <coughs> it's a choice that's based on something else than an assessment that anything like, like class politics will immediately turn people off, because that doesn't appear to be the case if you look at, at labor developments in recent years. Now, uh, a lot of things too, but we just have a few minutes on, on Nigeria and, and everything else. Let, let me just say this. I'm not in favor of doing crazy things. I mean, I can dream about doing crazy, crazy. <laughs> and because I honestly, I mean, some kind of insanity is a reflection of the state of the, the planet. So I, I try to try excuse my insanity with that. But look, look at, look, for instance, the attack that ha happened in Akbaik, the world's largest oil refinery, where some drones from the Houthi rebels a, a few weeks back swarmed in and just took out half of Saudi Arabia's oil supply. Not a single human body injured. One more can I climb back to this dream one. But we keep that in the, in the Department of, of Dreams for the time being, and instead say that <laughs> if, if we are to consider any kind of sabotage, which, by the way, XR is doing, I mean, Roger Hallam, he said that he would fly a drone into the Heathrow Airport, but just because the guy is so in love with the, with the civil disobedience protocol, he was stupid enough to tell cops beforehand <laughs> that he would do it. So, of course, they come and arrest him. If you want to do sabotage, you do it in the dark. <laughs> if, you, if you actually want to accomplish something. And we need to accomplish stuff. And I, some of you might, might remember from another cycle of climate activism in this country that we had something called, ridiculously, I admit, um, Asphalt Singers India Honor. <laughs> Indians of the concrete jungle back in 2007, they went deflating the tires of SUVs and we could take a 200 and Oster Mile one night. Very gentle kind of sabotage, extremely soft, no property even damaged. If we could do that in 2007 without facing any kind of popular backlash, which I take it to, to have been the case, imagine what we could do now with the, the kind of popular awareness that we have, with how scared people are about climate change. Imagine if we were to attack SUVs the next extreme summer with wildfires and droughts, based on the report in The Guardian yesterday that SUVs are the second largest driver of emissions growth in the world since 2010. Can you imagine how insane that is? SUVs who do not fulfill a single perceptible human need <laughs> are the second driver of emissions growth in the world today. Of course we should sabotage. <laughs> and of course, I mean, in a city like Berlin where there is popular revulsion against those cars because they kill people all the time in accidents. I don't think it would be difficult, or I don't think it would be impossible at least, to get some popular support for SAPT. But you need to live in the movement and not outside of it. You need to, to, be, to, to have very sensitive antennas to what, what kind of conjunction you're in, what, what move, how movements are, are, are operating and what problems or challenges they're working with. And there is definitely a danger in fetishizing sabotage or any other tactic. And then you see uh, in, the, in the deep ecology tradition with the you know, Earth First, Animal Liberation Front, Earth Liberation Front, and who actually practiced sabotage at some scale in the 80s and 90s and didn't really achieve anything. And uh, yeah, I, I, we could go deeper into that, but I'll skip here. But my, my, my point is not to do crazy things, but to perhaps be a little more crazy than we are right now. <laughs> because the times demand it.